Ladies and gentlemen, we are on chapter 37 today. We are talking technology and politics. Um, to the left of your screen, you have your key terms that you need to define. And then to the right hand side, you have your discussion questions that you need to answer. Um, so we're just going to jump on right in. So technology and politics today, again, I'm going to remind you of your definition of politics and about um, politics refers to the governing of people, not necessarily political parties. Um, and all that jazz, but it is an idea of control and a hierarchy of power systems. Um, so when we talk technology and politics today, um, what we're considering is yet again, still the influence of corporations and companies, um, privatized versus public access to media technologies and domains, um, the influence of that information, and then how that information is then perceived um, and taken out into the larger world. So contemporary media ecology is that audiences have been liberated from passive age of mass media. So the idea is that in recent years, um, media audiences are no longer just merely gonna sit back and listen to the information being presented to them, but they are going to actively participate um, in with that information and fight back against it, if you will. They're going to ask questions, they're going to inquire, they're going to research, and they're going to engage with the media information that they're being handed. So Brecht and Eisenberger suggested that this issue um, of media ecology isn't just about the message and the um, that the audiences are receiving, like the media information, but also the availability of technology um, so that people can continually interact and that enough people can interact from different backgrounds. Um, so the idea is that the internet, hmm, I apologize, I yawned. So the idea behind Brett and Eisenberger um, kind of came from when the internet and the World Wide Web were new technologies that introduced this idea that communication was no longer one to many. Um, we started having many to many, we had many to one, all different types of communications emerge in our world um, thanks to the internet. Um, and so when we're looking at media ecology and this idea that audiences can participate and you've got this many to many communication, you have a lot more debate, you have a lot more discussion and participation going on in the public sphere. Um, problem was, is that that public sphere was predominantly controlled by um, private companies, corporations, um, people who could buy their way in, essentially. Um, and so what happened? Of course, people responded because they were not okay with this idea that corporations and private companies could buy their way in. So we had the indie media get introduced. Um, and the indie media was kind of an anti-globalization, alter globalization movement, um, because what happened was people were still upset that corporations could buy their way in um, or by the attention of audiences. And so you had this group of activists come along and they said, you know what, here's what we're gonna do. We are going to introduce a system that allows for the common man to participate in producing news and media. Um, and we call this indie media. So they had this going for them, um, but they of course lacked organization because there was no hierarchical system um, and they weren't able to really launch themselves mainstream like some of the other media sources could and did at the time. So we had sites like Blogger and Live Journal and WordPress. Um, the good thing was is that you didn't need a whole lot of HTML and coding knowledge to be able to work a computer and put your ideas out on the internet, YouTube. Um, and all of those were examples of indie media. Um, but again, like I said, the problem was is that you didn't have the funding to back and outdo these previously established organizations. Um, 
So Blogger, LiveJournal, WordPress, YouTube, these are all going to be called what we call user generated content or UGCs. Um, and in the 1980s and 1990s, at the introduction of the internet, UGCs would have been considered very radical, uh, meaning that they were very severe. It was completely new and different and wild, um, but somewhat necessary. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the UGCs ended up being bought out by the platforms that were already previously established. And essentially they become multi-billion dollar corporations um, because money makes the world go round. Um, and that's how politics work. Politics and um, economics, um, money could just about buy anything. Um, and so Brian Winston described this as the law of suppression, meaning that um, these new wave ideas, no matter how popular they were, um, no matter how well intended they were, they are always going to be outdone by the pre-existing institutions. Um, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, whoever, insert news media outlet here, um, they're always going to be able to trump these privately owned um, individual small public sectors of news outlets um, because they've got the money and the fan base already established to do so. Um, but UGC did allow um, people to get their voice out there. So there are still many examples of UGC platforms. People are still obviously participating in them. Um, it's a lot easier now for the common person to have their voice heard, um, which is great. And it does add to the democratic system somewhat because at least you can put your voice out there. Um, so Jody Dean argues that this idea of um, law of suppression that Brian Winston describes um, it can instead be considered an expression of neoliberal capitalism, whose emphasis on being an individual consumer mirrors the activity found within social media. Um, so Jody argues that corporations will um, buy out these UGCs because the UGCs aren't really um, putting out any new information. They are merely mirroring what is already out there and so they're essentially useless. Um, however, Clay Sharkey, among others, claim that network technology has made society better, as I already explained, because people are more connected, people can freely express themselves on these UGCs and just get their ideas out there, get their information out there, let their voices be heard, you know? Um, and nine times out of 10, that's really all that people want is to be able to express themselves freely and openly um, without fear of consequence. Um, however, there are a lot of different contingencies on this. And so another opposing viewpoint is Envy Morozov. Um, and he explores ways that technologies are used by governments around the world as tools for surveillance. Um, hopefully before the semester ends, we'll get into this a little bit more and we'll talk about privacy. Um, and because we've kind of already talked about targeted advertising and data management um, and digital media and how certain like social media platforms utilize the user profiles to gather and obtain information. Um, so you have all of these competing views inside technology and politics from Brett and Eisenberger at the top about the availability of technology. You have the user generated content and the indie media, which allows individuals to be a part of the news by creating the news. You've got Brian Winston and the law of suppression, Jody Dean and neoliberal capitalism, Clark Shirky and her belief that technology has been made better um, by UGCs. And Morozov, who is studying and considering security, privacy, and surveillance. So we can see that there are a range of competing discourses surrounding media technology and politics. 
Um, and these different discourses have all different ranges. They have all different facets. Um, whether or not they're competing and generating more discussion, that's the whole point of a chapter like this is just to start the conversation and see where it leads. What other you know, discussion do you wanna add? What other points should people be considering? Um, and how well informed are users? And how well informed is society as far as technology and politics go? So there's your chapter 37, um, which is gonna be it for today. Um, you do have chapters 38 and 39 um, to complete as well before we take our test on Thursday, April 9th, okay? Um, so don't forget about that. We are winding down and making our way through the rest of this unit, guys. Make sure you've got your key terms for every single chapter, your discussion questions for every single chapter. Those are due to be turned into Canvas on Wednesday, April 8th, if I'm not mistaken, okay? So have a great day and talk to you all soon.